You know, I learned some of this from you, you know. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, congratulations to you for making it out through this uh, not very pleasant weather for Visha and for being with us for what I'm quite sure you'll find to be a very interesting uh, and uh, instructive talk this afternoon. I've been asked to make one announcement before we get to the subject of uh, the talk at hand. There will be closed circuit videotape uh, playbacks of uh, the now famous uh, speech by Vice President Spiro Agnew in Des Moines a couple of years or so ago when he made that famous attack on uh, the news media with particular reference to the area in which our speaker this afternoon has special interest, namely network television news reporting. Uh, they'll be in Carver Hall uh, in rooms 150, 160, and 174, if any of you care to make a note of that. Carver Hall, rooms 150, 160, and 174, starting at 3 p.m. I might mention, as uh, our speaker uh, of the afternoon was discussing with uh, uh, Bob Mulhall, the manager of WI, and some of the rest of us last evening, it was, whether you were aware of it or not, only through the ingenuity and the very rapid uh, ability of WI-TV to get color cameras and gear down to Des Moines on very short notice, which made it possible for that Spiro Agnew speech to be broadcast uh, simultaneously live by all three of the network uh, uh, television operations in color. It was a WOI origination, although it was in Des Moines, one block from another television station whose call letters I will not mention. <laughs> all right. I'm going to be personal in just a moment or two of this introduction, if you'll pardon me, because I do have the privilege of introducing an old friend. Uh, back in the early 1930s, long time ago, our speaker and I were students together at what then was not only the world's oldest, but was the world's largest school of journalism. And many times, as he and I have met each other since, as our paths have crossed at various places around the world, uh, we've shared with each other what seems to us to be a rather delightful irony. And that was that when we received our journalism degrees from that institution, nobody, but nobody, in the world's oldest journalism school had ever once hinted to us that it might be possible for anybody to have a useful career in broadcast journalism. This had never been mentioned to us as a part of our educations. And indeed, the thought that broadcasting would become the most heavily depended on source of news by the American people, that thought apparently had never even entered the heads of the journalism faculty people in those days. And I might mention that was a rather common attitude of journalism faculty people. Nevertheless, the man we'll hear this afternoon has had a distinguished career in journalism, now spanning nearly 40 years, one that has made him one of the world's best known and most respected executives in the field of radio and television news. He's been the president, as most of you know, of ABC News since 1963. During that time, his network has scored some of the most remarkable gains in audience and prestige in the recent history of broadcast news reporting. Both in radio, where ABC is the only network to operate four separate programming services, each of them focused on news, and in television, ABC News has quite literally been the talk of the broadcast industry in recent years. And Mr. Lauer is also the man who conceived and guided ABC's unusual, widely praised coverage of the national political conventions in 1968. That's, you know, when they got away from those interminable gavel-to-gavel -gavel ideas of covering a convention, and instead provided their viewers with a 90-minute convention summary and analysis each night in prime time. Elmer Lauer is probably unique in the depth of his experience with each of America's major television networks. He was the vice president and general manager of NBC News in New York before he joined ABC. 
From 1953 to 59, he worked with CBS News. Among other things, he was the head of their Washington News Bureau. He's been a foreign correspondent, a bureau chief for Time and Life magazines. He served with two U.S. government information agencies. He has a broad background as a reporter and editor with a number of newspapers and wire services. And he holds a master's degree in public law and government from Columbia University. He's received a wide variety of honors. They include awards from Fordham University and Ohio University. But I'm reasonably sure that one of the proudest moments for him came in 1959 when that school of journalism down at the University of Missouri, which hadn't ever hinted that a student might just possibly make it big in such a thing as broadcast journalism, when that same school of journalism presented him its most coveted award, the Honor Medal for Distinguished Service in Journalism. And he deserved it. He's quite a guy. Today he's going to talk to us about the challenge to the world's press. And I consider it a distinct honor to be able to present to you my longtime friend, one of the outstanding executives in broadcast journalism today, Elmer Lauer, the president of ABC News. Elmer? Thank you very much, Jack. Let me get organized for a minute here, and then I'll get this show on the road. Uh, thanks to you for <coughs> braving the rain to come out here today. Uh, the plot was really to have it outside and get me leading a student demonstration or something, and <laughs> so they could send uh, the pictures back to Leonard Goldenson and say I'm a real activist. Might show him to Spiro Agnew too, but he knows that already. <laughs> I was going to plead not guilty and say it wasn't E. Lauer who was leading you; it was J. Lauer, and J. Lauer has some experience from uh, a couple of years ago at Northwestern. Uh, he and 40 other uh, students, men and women, tried to render the Naval ROTC inoperative in the wake of Kent State. Um, so uh, I'm not that kind of a rebel, though, uh, uh, at least not in his eyes, uh, and perhaps not in your eyes either. I, I guess I'm identified with the establishment, and uh, Vice President Agnew would even say the Eastern liberal establishment. Uh, I'm from the East, all right. I'm from south of you. I originally come from Kansas City. And uh, when Jack left Boone, Iowa, to come down to the University of Missouri at Columbia, why well, he and I met there, and uh, so that's about the kind of east. Uh, not loud enough for you? Um, okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Dorcas. No, um, you know, like I'm from Kansas City. Uh, Howard Smith is from Faraday, Louisiana. Uh, Harry Reisner is uh, from Dakota City, Iowa, which I understand is a suburb of Humboldt. <laughs> Uh, and I believe he uh, spent six of his grade school education years nearby here. Is it Napier? Napier, yes, where, they, where his father was superintendent of school. So we've got all Eastern liberals back there. Uh, we've got uh, just as much hayseed left in our hair as anybody out here in the plains. Uh, I come out here quite often. Uh, uh, this is my second trip to Iowa this year, and I go to Missouri quite often. Um, I think I have my finger pretty much uh, on the on the pulse of middle America, if you want to call it that. Um, and we, we get out here to do stories frequently. We did uh, a half-hour documentary some time back uh, on Riceville, Iowa. I think the population is 1,000, a beautiful story of a, a second grade class in the Riceville Public Schools. Uh, last year we did a half-hour on middle America in Grand Island, Nebraska. And this year, we've gone to see what the South looks like, the New South, that is, in, in um, Jackson, uh, Tennessee. So um, let's talk a while today about uh, some problems that uh, face us in broadcasting, uh, problems that are of great interest to me, and they should be of great in interest to you uh, as students who are going to be out of school soon and citizens in this great country of ours. Uh, last week, ABC News correspondent Jim Bennett was filming in Play Coup, South Vietnam. He was preparing a story on refugees fleeing the advancing North Vietnamese invaders. And among those flying out of Play Coup were dependents of the South Vietnamese defenders of the city. 
when the South Vietnamese commander of the Pleiku Air Base heard of this, he decided that the film would be demoralizing and would be bad news. He stopped Bennett and demanded the film. Bennett, thinking very quickly, switched film roles. It's an old trick. And turned over to the South Vietnamese officer a roll of blank film. The officer, thinking it was the real film, gleefully exposed it to the light, and Bennett kept the news film, sent it to us, and we had it on the air. Well, I learned of this story in this cable here from our Saigon Bureau, and it told me a lot about the attitude of that Vietnamese, South Vietnamese officer, and unhappily, a lot about the attitude of many people toward the press. It was the film of the departing defendants that was bad news. It was the story, the news story, that he considered demoralizing. With a horde of well-armed and dedicated enemy troops breathing down his neck, the commander went out of his way to confiscate the film and to do what he believed he was doing, blocking news from being distributed. Well, even if he had succeeded, I ask, would the refugees not have fled? Would the North Vietnamese have turned around and gone home? Well, I think not. That incident in play coup might have become one of a number of stories I've been collate, collecting lately, horror stories of the media. And let me tell you just a few of them this afternoon. Item. <clears throat> a respected newspaper publisher spent six months and four days outside his native land as a visiting professor in another country. Upon his return, his homeland government took action to force him to divest himself of his newspaper. He had violated a rule forbidding editors and publishers to reside outside their country for more than six months. He was four days over. The country was Peru. The government, not surprisingly, is a repressive military dictatorship. That government has already expropriated two opposition newspapers and purchased a third. Another tale. An American newsman finds evidence of a bloody massacre conducted by army troops. The army captures the newsman, tortures, and murders him. The newsman was 33-year-old Nick Stroh, who worked for ABC News and several American newspapers and magazines. The location was Uganda. The Ugandan government has yet to explain satisfactorily either the massacre or Nick Stroh's disappearance. There is no doubt that he's dead. A nation's most prominent correspondent writes a piece about his country's armed forces. The military, insulted by the article, brings the journalist to trial before a military tribunal. Found guilty, he is sentenced to six months imprisonment. The country is Spain. In another country, a cartoonist draws a sketch of an army officer signing an edict with his foot. Tried by a military court, the cartoonist spends three months in jail. This time, the outrage is in Argentina. A reporter writes a story. A censor deems it unacceptable. The newspaper, and I have it here, is printed without the story. <clears throat> you probably can't see it from the back of the room, but it's just absolute white space on a Saigon paper. But with the space left open to tell the public it is missing something. That's Vietnam, South Vietnam. Well, in North Vietnam, the story probably would never have been written in the first place. A visiting dignitary's motorcade is covered in a newspaper. Through a typographical mishap, printers misplace a key paragraph. The headline over the story refers to events detailed in that paragraph. The 60-year-old publisher is found guilty of, of printing a misleading headline. He is fined over $3,000 and sentenced to seven months imprisonment. The publisher happens to operate Greece's only English language newspaper. The headline, ironically, concerned a prominent American critic of journalism who has been mentioned here today. It read, 
bombs and recruited school children greet Agnew. Incidentally, it did the publisher no good to plead that the headline was factually correct. Two more brief stories. A 75-year-old editor publisher prints a column attacking the record of an office holder. The office holder demands to have a reply printed. The editor rejects the reply, deeming it an attack on the writer of the original column and not a reply at all. He is charged under a press law with failing to print a reply. And finally, a newspaper prints an article by a participant in an apparently illegal activity. The article is properly bylined. There is no doubt about its authorship. Yet prosecutors go to court to demand the original manuscript to be used against the writer in a criminal case. Despite a law guaranteeing that no journalist may be compelled to, and I quote, disclose any news or the source of any such news coming to his possession in the, gather in the course of gathering news, in spite of that, the court rules the original manuscript must be surrendered. Where did these last two events take place? Not in a South American military dictatorship, not in an Iron Curtain country where all organs of opinion are owned and operated by the state or by the single political party, not in a country imposing wartime curbs on its press because of national security considerations. The agent publisher who refused to print that candidate's reply to his column is in Florida. He was charged under an 80-year-old law which many observers feel is clearly unconstitutional. The publication compelled by the court to produce the original manuscript is in New York, the state with the nation's strongest press protection law. Well, if the court decision is permitted to stand, this law will have been eroded before it's two years old. Now, <clears throat> I do not think that the state of freedom of the press in this country is in the same ragged shape as it is in in Peru, Uganda, Spain, mainland China, Argentina, South or North Vietnam, or Greece. Our press is freer. There is no question of that. Our First Amendment guarantee of a free press is quite simple. It reads unequivocally, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. No law, no law at all. And by press, it is my feeling and the feeling of a vast number of jurists and lawyers that the Founding Fathers did not mean to free machines which print words, but meant to free the men who write the words. I am convinced that what the framers of the Constitution meant was that journalism, and hence journalists, would be free of government interference, broadcast journalists as well as print journalists. Senator Sam J. Irvin, Jr., probably the foremost expert on the Constitution in the United States Congress, has said, if First Amendment principles are held not to apply to the broadcast media, it may well be that the Constitution's guarantee of a free press is on its deathbed. Yet, press freedom is under attack here today. Why? Well, it's because a number of people agree with Abraham Lincoln's thought that and I quote him, public opinion is everything. He who molds public opinion goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces decisions. Yes, there are those, and of a variety of political stripes, who would mold public opinion by distorting facts. And the only way facts can be distorted is if the press is kept ignorant, indolent, intimidated, or completely controlled. Well, this is not the habit of American journalism. On the whole, we have been a brash, inquiring, irreverent press. I don't think that we're going to give up those traits and become ignorant, indolent, intimidated, or controlled without a fight. Now, let's look at some of the areas of the world where the press is ignorant, in indolent, intimidated, or controlled. We don't have to look very far or very hard. In almost every country, including some which bill themselves as American-style democracies, press freedom is at best a sometimes thing. To get some of the ideas of the state of press freedom around the world, 
I recently wrote to ABC News correspondents on every continent and asked them what was the state of freedom of the press in their country or the countries that they cover as they travel around. Well, let's look first at those countries which have the excuse of war conditions to justify restrictions or harassment of the press. I've already told you about Jim Bennett's adventures in play coup, and I could give you a number of other uh, examples uh, of what's going on in Vietnam. Let us just say that the American correspondents there are not censored by the American military. There is no American military censorship. For Vietnamese correspondents and Vietnamese dailies, there is censorship. But sometimes people try to block our men from getting places by not giving them jeeps or not letting them travel by helicopter. And believe me, it's plenty tough to, uh, to work in Vietnam today. Uh, it was dangerous enough when the American Army had 550,000 men out there. But you at least had good intelligence during that time and knew where to go and where not to go. With the South Vietnamese controlling all the land areas now, or practically all of them, why, it's a very difficult and dangerous thing. To date, uh, <coughs> 30 correspondents have been killed, more than 200 wounded, including nine ABC News staff people, and 17 are missing and presumed captured by communist forces. The missing, incidentally, were all taken in Cambodia. The most recent woundings of six newsmen took place only four weeks, four weeks ago. The aftermath of war leaves the bad habit of interference with or obstruction of the press. Recently, our Rome Bureau Chief Barry Dunsmore went to Nigeria to try to film the story of how the former breakaway province of Biafra was being reintegrated into the country after the violent civil war there. Well, arriving, arriving in Lagos with legal visas, Dunsmore and his camera crew met with a four-day delay on request to film. The Ministry of Information finally turned down their request flatly. They explained that he should have applied for visas in Washington instead of Rome, and, and, and he should have filed a complete outline of his film project at that time. Well, if that had been approved, a ministry representative would have accompanied the crew to make sure that they followed the outline to the letter. Well, you see, he's supposed to know what he's going to find before he finds it. Uh, that's a strange sort of logic. Uh, many countries have laws guaranteeing freedom of the press and practices guaranteeing and practices guaranteeing imprisonment of the press. Last year I visited South America and went to seven countries there and press freedoms in all over that continent are at best tenuous. Argentina, Peru, Uruguay have laws assuring a free press. Uh, in Peru, the law with about, with about a George Orwell is called the Statutes of the Freedom of the Press, yet the statutes allow the government to effectively control the Peruvian press. In Argentina, the press guarantees in the Constitution are overridden by the Statutes of Argentine Revolution. In Uruguay, the euphemistic title of the laws which enable the government to control the mass media is Measures of Quick Security. These permit the president to close down any mass medium which violates government orders concerning reporting of the Tupa activities of the Tupamaro guerrillas. Brazil's Institutional Act 5, decreed in 1968, suspended freedom of the press in that country. Although there is no prior cen censorship, penalties are quite severe, and publishers censor themselves. Avenues for revenge against wayward newsmen in Brazil include fines, suspensions of political rights or imprisonment. It's a pretty sad situation. Time magazine, which sells about 25,000 copies in Brazil, was censored for an article that the government didn't like, censored in Brazil. And for five weeks, a satirical newspaper was forced to suspend publication, and its editorial staff was jailed. Their satiric barbs had pricked some thin official skins. In Greece, democracy's birthplace, a tough press law passed in October 1969 lifted the total censorship, which was imposed by the military junta after it took over in 1967. This law holds publishers and editors personally responsible for editorial content and imposes severe penalties for infractions. Using the law, the military government was able to put the liberal anti-regime newspaper Ethnos out of business by imprisoning 
its four top executives. In another effort to control the press, a new law was introduced recently by the Greek military government. This would have Greek officials rule on the qualifications for those who would be journalists. Some requirements, such as an annual loyalty oath and close adherence to the Hellenic Christian tradition, have been deleted. But it is an ominous threat, I think, for a government to certify which journalists can cover its activities. Socrates drank hemlock rather than compromise his principles and speak anything but the truth. Today in Greece, editors and publishers aren't being fed hemlock, but sticking to the truth is almost as dangerous for them as it was for Socrates. Similar situations prevail in Spain and Portugal. While both Iberian governments claim that they have freedom of the press, the suspension of publications for months on end and jailing of journalists is common. Broadcast journalism, by the way, does not really exist in Greece, Spain, or Portugal. In all three of those European countries, it's the government which decides what goes on the air. Italy has an unusual situation. The newspapers, many of them owned by political parties, are free. There is no censorship. RAI, which is the government agency running all radio and television in Italy, reflects the views of the government. But that isn't as simple as it sounds, since the Italian government is usually a coalition. Therefore, each party's views are represented on RAI broadcasts. The result, I am told, is chaos, but even dull chaos. In France, the divergence between freedom of the printed press and the broadcast press is greater than in most democracies. Basically, the Constitution guarantees freedom of the printed press, although outlawed organizations are forbidden to publish newspapers. But the police may seize, and they have, all copies of publications containing so-called illegal or offensive material. Publishers then have to sue to get their papers released. But the restraints are far less severe for on newspapers than they are on broadcast media. In generally, France's newspapers are overwhelmingly anti-government. When President de Gaulle was alive, he was said to be unconcerned about the opposition he received from newspapers. He had total control of broadcasting. He made the French airwaves his personal airwaves. Also, there have been claims at ORTF, which is the French Radio Television Authority, uh, that the captive airways of France are still not free. President Pompidou has declared that French television newsmen are unlike other journalists. They are universally considered to be the voice of France and therefore have a responsibility to speak and behave accordingly. The British. Our closest allies operate under far greater press restraints than we do in the United States. Libel laws are stricter than in the US, and while the confidentiality of news sources is recognized, it is not recognized, is recognized by newsmen as a professional code, it is not recognized by the law. In fact, a BBC correspondent last year received a short jail term for refusing to name the Irish Republican Army leaders whom he had interviewed. The British also have something called the D-notice system, and D in this case stands for defense. The system works this way. When defense authorities consider some item detrimental to the country's national interest, notices outlining the nature of the item are circulated confidentially to newspapers and broadcasters. The notices are formal letters of request. Almost invariably, compliance is forthcoming. Well, these letters have no legal force, but they are adhered to. Our London bureau chief says he finds it inconceivable that there could be in Britain a Whitehall Papers equivalent of our Pentagon Papers incident of last year. In general, the British press and British broadcasters are treated equally, although the government, through the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, retains ultimate control over broadcasting. The minister has the power to prohibit the broadcasting on both the government chartered BBC and the commercial independent television authority. He has the power to prohibit the broadcasting of any particular item or any class of item and to revoke licenses at any time. In practice, this veto over broadcasting an entire class of items has never been exercised. But the power does exist. It is greater than the power which Congress has given to the FCC over broadcasting in this country. Earlier, I mentioned that a BBC man had gone to jail 
rather than reveal the names of IRA leaders he had interviewed. The IRA and the Ulster problem have cast a pall over all of British journalism, but especially over the BBC. David Webster, the New York bureau chief of the BBC, put it this way, Ulster is a difficult, complex, and emotional problem, <clears throat> especially since the BBC broadcasts into the very, broadcasts its television and radio news programs into the very trouble area itself. Because of the touchiness of this, Webster says, the BBC is making efforts to see that the coverage will be fair, judicial, impartial, and not contribute to further violence. Well, I'm not so sure the two concerns are always compatible. Uh, for example, the Irish Republican Army, uh, outlawed though it is, is certainly very much a part of the Ulster story. Yet the top echelon of the BBC will not permit any more interviews with IRA leaders to be put on its air. the Irish Republican Army, uh, outlawed though it is, is certainly very much a part of the Ulster story. Yet the top echelon of the BBC will not permit any more interviews with IRA leaders to be put on its air. There are still other ways of controlling the media and having governments which in Lincoln's terms mold public opinion. In Venezuela, for example, the government is the largest single advertiser in the country. Commercial necessity dictates a cautious press. All broadcasters in Venezuela operate on state concessions, and it is possible for them to be forced off the air for airing news and commentary the government doesn't like. We already talked some about France and Italy, but another of the problems there is that uh, the press in both countries uh, has a subsidy which is for newsprint. Uh, and the whole thing amounts to a vast amount of money and the industry might be in the red if it didn't have this subsidy. Uh, there are, of course, some countries where there are no press freedoms at all. Uh, mainland China is one of these. During the President's trip there in February, Harry Reasoner reported that one of the main problems for American journalists covering the presidential trip was explaining the traditional American view of the news gathering profession to their Chinese counterparts with whom they had dinners occasionally. And uh, uh, Reasoner said that he was talking to one Chinese journalist and he asked him what he thought his main job was. And the Chinese said it was to help the government serve the people. And Reasoner said, well, suppose uh, the government does something bad. And that stopped the Chinese journalist. The theory is, says Reasoner, the government of mainland China cannot do anything bad. The captive Chinese press, of course, followed the government line in its coverage of President Nixon's visit there. Uh, we were not censored at all. That was the agreement uh, before we went there, and it was adhered to. Most Americans think that the press in the Soviet Union, where President Nixon's going next, is a captive press like the Chinese press. But last October, the dean of the journalism school at Moscow State University came to the United States and said that the press in his country was freer than the press in this country. And I quote him, the American press is free as long as it defends the interests of the capitalist class. The Soviet press, on the other hand, he says, is really free because the papers take care of the national interest of our country. He then went on to say that there are only three things Soviet papers do not print. Anti-Soviet Soviet or anti-communist propaganda, military propaganda, and pornography. I asked our Moscow bureau chief, Irv Chapman, who has been there three years now and who is not terribly popular with the Russians at this stage, I asked him about that and he replied, this is probably the shortest response you will get to your inquiry about freedom of the press. In the Soviet Union, there isn't any. That answers half the Moscow dean's assertion that the Soviet press is free. It isn't. How about the other half? The contentions that the United States press isn't free or isn't as free as the Soviet press. 
How does the First Amendment stand up after close to 200 years of rough and tumble use and abuse? Well, the, man who, the men who agree with Lincoln about molding public opinion apparently never read what else Lincoln said about the public, but I'm sure that maybe a lot of you have here, you students. I am a firm believer in the people, the great emancipator said. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts. Some of our, uh, some of our would be opinion molders today don't see it that way. They'd rather try to do something Lincoln warned couldn't be done, fool all the people all the time. There are five general areas of danger to freedom of the press today, and I'd like to list them briefly for you and discuss them shortly. They are limitation of public access, unnecessary governmental secrecy, harassment of some elements of the press, unwarranted subpoenas, and the problem of police and other government agencies posing as news gatherers. Now let me make clear that the adversary relationship between government and the press is nothing new. Every American president since George Washington has paid journalistic lip service to press freedom and at the same time has wished somehow that he could manage the way that the press depicted his administration and reported about it. Some presidents have tried to manage the news gently, some wittily, some sneakily, and some have tried to do it with a heavy hand or the hint of outright intimidation. Well, let me state here and now that I, for one, and most of my colleagues, welcome valid, constructive criticism. We don't contend we're perfect. We do not consider ourselves above criticism but neither should politicians. What situation prevails today? Has healthy criticism gone over the line and become dark threats of intimidation? Well, at least one member of the United States Congress, Represent Representative Lionel Van Dierlen of California, a Democrat who, before he was a reporter, uh, before he was a, a congressman, was a reporter and a radio broadcaster, thinks that this is the case. Never, he said in a recent speech, have the guarantees of press and speech freedom appeared so tenuous or so vulnerable. Well, I'll take exception to that. The times may be bleak, but they aren't as bad as they were at the turn of the 18th century when the Alien and Sedition Acts made it a crime to criticize the government. Let's hope that concerned representatives, like Representative Van Dierlen, will help us keep those dark days from recurring. Well, let's talk about access. Happily, denying newsmen the right to cover an event is not a common practice in this country. Recently, in New York City, newsmen were barred from the trial of a notorious and vicious criminal. The judge said he wanted to avoid a trial by press. Well, the jury found the accused guilty anyway, even without us present. There is at present an access problem pending at the United Nations. Late last year, when the People's Republic of China displaced uh, the uh, Republic of China, that is the, you know, Taiwan, in the General Assembly and in the Security Council and on all other United Nations bodies and affiliates, the accreditation of two Chinese nationalist correspondents was suspended. Well, these nationalist newsmen representing Central News Agency of China were ruled to be representing Chiang Kai-shek's government not the news, organization of Taiwan, news organizations of Taiwan. So the UN kicked them out. And we've been protesting that ever since, and I hope that we're going to get them reinstated, but I'm not positive of that. Just another incident. In this country, newsmen are not disaccredited and expelled from the halls of Congress, but there are important denials of access in Washington. Television cameras are barred from full sessions of both the House and the Senate although committees of each, at the discretion of the committee chairman, can admit us. And I tell you, I'm very pleased to learn here last night and today that, uh, that your legislature does permit uh, cameras and microphones. I think that's fine in this state. I consider that to be an enlightened decision. Well, I think this, the situation in Washington in this respect on the Hill is not only unfair to newsmen, that's not the important thing, the important thing that is unfair to the public. 
the public is deprived of a first-hand view of how its representatives carry out their jobs. And if denial of access is not challenged and strenuously challenged, we will find more and more doors closed to the press and through the press to the public. That is not the way this country is supposed to work. We are supposed to have an open society. Closely related to the access problem is the secrecy problem. Obviously, if something is a sensitive secret, newsmen and the public must be denied access to it. I think none of us wants to give away vital secrets which will hurt our country. But none of us wants to cooperate in schemes to keep secret material which all Americans have a right to know about. Jack Anderson, earlier this week, won a Pulitzer Prize for exposing some secrets which were not vital to our national defense or national well-being, although the administration in Washington felt more comfortable with those facts kept from the public view than it did when the facts were published. Those Anderson papers revealing the inner workings of, inner workings of the administration during the Indo-Pakistani War illustrate how that top secret stamp can be used to keep the truth from the public. As a nation, we were being told one thing while our government was doing another. Four and a half years ago, a Freedom of Information Act was passed promising to open up government files and to permit a freer flow of information than ever before. Yet, despite some gains, the bureaucrats have found a number of ways of, of keeping us from getting what we're entitled to under, under that act. Um, the danger of this obsession with secrecy is quite clear. And let me quote here, because I think it's very well put by the British magazine that's highly respected, The Economist. The Economist summed it up this way. Clearly, and I quote, clearly there is a continuing need for a law to prevent the passing on of material that could damage the state. And that could, and that could certainly include the texts of confidential exchanges with foreign government. But, the economist continues, the law should be much narrower and much more explicit. What the law should not do, as it does at present, is to afford protection to ministers and ex-ministers from political embarrassment." End of quotation. Well, let's talk about uh, harassment for a minute, uh, harassment of some elements of the press. We've talked a lot today about Vice President Agnew's speech here in Des Moines, and I think the point of that, uh, other than the fact that I refute his argument that the Nixon administration wasn't getting a fair deal uh, from broadcast news, but I think the, the, the ominous part of that was a sort of uh, almost threat, or rather thinly veiled, that broadcasters are licensed and that they could lose their licenses. I think this message came through in there. Uh, I think you're all pretty familiar with the uh, CBS uh, uh, case before the House uh, uh, Commerce Committee, uh, where, whereby uh, the Commerce Committee tried to force CBS to give up the outtakes and all its notes and all its materials on that documentary, uh, The Selling uh, of the Pentagon. Uh, so I think that's an, an item. Um, then also last year, of course, uh, last summer we were involved in the Pentagon Papers case where the government tried to obtain a writ of prior restraint against the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other newspapers. I think it would have been uh, very bad had, uh, for the press and for you uh, had prior restraint been agreed to in this case. Um, also, sometimes there's some intimidation in regard to uh, reporters themselves. Uh, Dan Shore, who was a very active CBS reporter in Washington, uh, once was a subject of a, uh, an FBI investigation. The FBI had been asked to investigate him by the White House. Uh, well, uh, the White House later said that Shore was being considered for a government position, but nobody had ever told Shore about the position. Uh, and uh, <laughs> It, uh, it was sort of intimidating because here they were going around talking to all his friends and asking about him, and they, in, a, in effect, uh, sowing some seeds of dis uh, questions about Shore. Uh, another item here, last November 17th, the desks of reporters in the press room of the Pentagon were searched after business hours. The reporters knew of that because cards were left behind reading, this desk has been checked for classified materials. 
None were found. Congratulations on following proper procedures. That's what the card said. Well, since newsmen are not permitted access to classified material in the first place, the snooping was either a poor joke or an attempt to harass the press. Well, the Pentagon Papers, like the Anderson Papers, ended up winning a Pulitzer this week, too. The New York Times received the award for public service for publishing the papers in the face of wide, widespread government opposition and attempted prior restraint. There was uh, some uh, disagreement on the Columbia University Board of Trustees, which let the awards go through but uh, was split, upon the, uh, split on the matter. More serious than harassment is the subpoena threat, I think. Repeatedly and despite guidelines to the contrary from the Justice Department, reporters' notes and film outtakes have been subpoenaed by prosecutors across the country. Well, what's wrong with this? Well, to quote one lower court ruling on the matter, to convert news gatherers into Department of Justice investigators is to invade the autonomy of the press by imposing a governmental function on them. As a practical, that's the end of that quote, but as a practical consideration, it seems to me that it interferes in news gathering because sources become more reluctant to speak to reporters if the newsman can't guarantee confidentiality. And there are several cases pending on this now, and hopefully I think the spirit of the First Amendment will prevail when they get to the courts, but that remains to be seen. A final and related problem is the practice of government agents and police posing as reporters in order to, to gather evidence. The harm this does, of course, is to undermine the credibility of real newsmen and to make the news gathering job that much more difficult. It could even endanger bona fide newsmen. A violence-prone militant group, for example, which had been betrayed by a bogus newsman might just take revenge on an actual newsman. Well, <clears throat> I hope the picture I've painted the First Amendment status in this country isn't too grim. There are bright spots, too. The California and Illinois legislatures, for example, have recently passed bills enabling newsmen to protect their sources, bringing to 19 the number of states with such laws. And a number of police agencies have promised not to, to, to keep their men from posing as reporters. Additionally, the Justice Department has laid down guidelines for the use of subpoenas, and one condition in those guidelines is that prosecutors must exhaust every possible method of obtaining the information needed before seeking to get the unpublished or unaired material in the possession of news organizations. And I think you read last fall, Senator Irvin has conducted extensive hearings. Uh, I was one of a number of people who testified there into the state of the First Amendment. And I hope that out of those hearings may come legislation which strengthens our freedom of the press in this country. But at least Senator Irvin has focused attention on this problem, which I think is a very good thing. Well, when I originally requested that our foreign correspondents send me reports on freedom of the press around the world, uh, in the countries they covered, our London bureau chief, George Watson, wrote me this note. Your request for information on freedom of the press prompted me to think back on my own reporting experiences over the past several years. I listed 30 countries in which I had worked, ranging from those with the most restrictive totalitarian regimes to ones with well-deserved reputations as pioneers of permissiveness. Yet nowhere on earth, this is Watson still writing, Nowhere on earth that I am aware of is there any place comparable to the United States where freedom of the press is so firmly established in constitutional theory and practices in unfettered fact. End of his quotation. Well, I would agree with that. As my friend Jack Shelley said, I've been in this business close to 40 years. And as a professional newsman, I think I've traveled in 60 to 70 countries. And I find just exactly what Watson finds, that nowhere is the press as free as it is here. But, there's always a but, we've seen what can happen in countries around the world. Those who have a vital interest in supporting a free press, and every American who values democracy must count himself among that number. Everyone must be on guard. We must be vigilant so that our press freedom does not, er does not erode the way we've seen today it has eroded in other countries because when one basic right is diminished, it is only a matter of time 
before the others also begin to shrink. The real target of the censor is not the newsman, but the news audience. Lincoln said, the great point is to bring them the real facts. As long as the media remain unfettered, unmolested, and unregulated, we can do that. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. I'll take questions. I have some time, and if you do, why, uh, I'm certainly open to your questions. But those of you who have classes to go to, oh, the classes are out, aren't they? Well, <laughs> well those of you who want to goof off, go ahead. <laughs> I won't be offended at all. I saw a hand down here. Yes. Well, the, the basic question you ask is one about, uh, it goes to the root of uh, how broadcasting has been constructed in this country. And I would gather by your question that uh, you disagree with the amount of material on the air that is entertainment and the amount of information uh, amount that is factual. Well, where, if, you're, if you want me to say that ABC News is not as thorough as the New York Times, yes, it, it's limiting. Well, could, I wouldn't be so foolish as to argue it otherwise. How could ABC be more about Well, I, that's what I'm trying to say is that what you're attacking here is not a single problem of how can ABC News put more on the air, but the whole theory of broadcasting as it's built up in this country. because. It's, it's the economic system under which broadcasting has been built up, and if you want to change that, uh, this, this is, uh, you know, you're welcome to try to change it. I'd like to ask your opinion. Does that need to be changed? Well, as, as, as a pragmatist, I don't think it's going to be changed. Seriously? Uh, I don't think, I don't think it's, I'm a practical man. I don't think in practice the system can be changed. I'm constantly for more news on the air, more documentaries on the air. Uh, I'm the guy who fights uh, within ABC every day to fight to get more on the air. Uh, I think there should be. Uh, but you have, a, you have a real practical problem here, though, because when we put lots of money into really good documentaries, the audience falls off. Now, how do you explain that? Why don't the people who want this support these? It's not very encouraging to my boss who runs the company to give me $200,000 to do a decent documentary on a subject which Americans should know about is vital information, and then you wind up with a, a rating so small that you can't even see it. Okay, but, but the difference is your boss looks at percentages. And it's, and it's well, only 12 million or, or 20 million people see it instead of you know, 50 million people watching the other show, then you know, it's the philosophy of the industry being the greatest number of viewers. Uh, I wish I, I'll take 20 million and run. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're talking more like, uh, say, 3 million or less. Uh, look, he, anybody who operates a broadcasting station is in business. Anybody down the street is in business. Now, these people are not going to stay in business if they can't return their stockholders an honest profit. If you disagree with the system under which broadcasting has been established in this country, that's your privilege. Maybe you want to see more money get into non-commercial broadcasting. It isn't today. Did it start out as that? No. The, well, I, I've worked in it 19 years. It hasn't made a profit since I've been there. Jack, uh, you've, been in, it, you've been in it close to 40 years. Uh, I would say on individual stations of the kind that we have in America, it has been uh, commercially sponsored since my earliest memory of it. Is that the answer? Well, he wants to know if it makes a profit. But I'll tell you, we spend, in uh, ABC News, our, for, that's the national organization, nothing to do with individual stations that we own. Uh, over $30 million a year, and we get, at maximum, about $15 million back in the sale of advertising. So 
the company is underwriting the news department to 15, to tune of $15 million. Okay, what percentage of that is, uh, corporation budget? No, I don't, I don't have that figure. Is that more than, than I, would, I would have to make a guess. Uh, I would have to make a guess. Uh, if I made it, it'd be way off, I'm sure. Would, it, would you say it was more than 5%? More than I honestly don't know, really. You've got me on grounds where I don't have the figures, and I'd be back in the back of the room. <clears throat> yeah, it's not too good. <laughs> well, um, in a longer version of this speech, and some of you probably thought this was too long, but in a longer version of it, uh, I've got a section of three or four pages about our experiences there during the Bangladesh uh, war, and uh, it's, uh, it's just very restrictive, that's all. Uh, our guys had a tough time, and uh, uh, you know sometimes they could get film out, and sometimes they couldn't. Uh, one of the greatest pieces of film we got out of Dhaka, uh, a lady ta taped it to her body with adhesive tape and carried it to Singapore. Um, we had uh, a lot of our film taken away from us in, uh, in Pakistan last year, film that had come from uh, East Pakistan when, when it was still one, and uh, the French television had all of, their, all of the documentary, 20,000 feet of film taken away from at the Karachi airport, which is where we lost ours. Uh, it's generally quite restrictive. Uh, because of your interest, I'll uh, get a commercial plug in for us. Watch next uh, week from this Sunday. We're going to have a 60-minute issues and answers program on the air with the prime ministers of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. We're there, we're there shooting it right now. Uh, uh, Sunday, May 14th, uh, you, I, hope we, I hope you'll see it here. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, 20 minutes with each. I think, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, two of our correspondents are there, each doing uh, the interviews in succession. Yes, sir. I expect you did. Uh, the question there was just, you know, how to get it out. Uh, we had 25 people there at one time, including couriers and everything. And from uh, from uh, Karachi, not, not from Rawalpindi, I believe, where we were working, or uh, anyways, from Pakistan, we were having to drive the film over the Khyber Pass every day to ship. From the Khyber Pass to Kabul, it was about a three-day round trip. They held the guy, the courier, about two hours at the border. And he, w he went on to Kabul, and on one occasion, he even had to go as far as Tehran to, to hand carry it to be sure that it got out. It was, a, it was a rough deal. But thank you very much. I'll tell the fellows that. They'll appreciate it. Yes, sir. With regards to such a fellow that you never did, I understand that the Justice Department to require the networks or to uh, have networks buy their television shows only from Well, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit limited in commenting on it because it's a case that's pending before the court, and uh, I'm not supposed to comment on it except to repeat the company's statement. The company's statement is that we think it's completely without merit. But the actual fact is, as the company pointed out, as our company pointed out in its statement, uh, we own very few of these programs today. I think there are two on ABC. Mod Squad happens to be one of them. Uh, that we own. But uh, you can make your own judgment uh, about this. However, I don't think this is about to happen. It's likely to be tied up in the courts five to ten years. But I think I'll have to stand on that simply because it's under adjudication and I can't comment further on it. Yes, sir.
Well, it's a hard decision. But uh, has the president ever been turned down with a request for a consultation? Uh, not on a, not on direct request, to my knowledge. But when the president of the United States has something important to say, uh, I'm not sure that I believe he should be turned down. Yeah. Well, this is what we're told. Yes, sir. No, it's a policy matter. Uh, they didn't have a documentary. They wanted to produce a documentary, just to correct your fact. Uh, this was a presidential commission, and they, they said, we want to produce a show about our report, and we want you to give us the time. Well, we think population growth is a controversial issue. And the policy of all three networks is that documentaries on controversial issues are produced under the control supervision of, AB, of the news department. And uh, we offered uh, this to this uh, group, to this commission, and that they didn't want to buy. Now, they're making a test case out of this, I think. They've gone to the FCC and said, we think the networks are wrong in this policy. And let's wait and see what the FCC says. I, I don't know what they're we oppose it naturally. Yes. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's gonna affect us. We did uh, amnesty the other night. Uh, I don't know whether you folks saw that or not. Pretty strong show. Uh, we did privacy during the course of the winter, invasion of privacy. Uh, another strong show. We've got one coming up on prisons. Uh, and then the schedule we've got ahead, and the one we had just behind hasn't affected us. Um, there were some criticisms of three uh, different uh, editing practices used in the selling of the Pentagon. Uh, and. We don't think that we've ever participated in, in practices like that, but we have tightened them up. In other words, if we have had an hour's interview with you and we're just going to use three minutes of it, uh, we think the three minutes should be at least faithful to what you said and not uh, put one paragraph that was before one or the other. But you're not really asking that question. I think you're asking about the overall thing. Is it going to make us more timid? And my answer is uh, I hope not, and uh, this is what I try to do to my staff. Uh, to see that they don't get timid about this. But at the same time, I insist on the highest standards in this because if we take a su tough subject, we ought to you, the public, to give it to you faithfully. And I don't want any errors of fact in there. I don't want any person's words that are twisted around. I don't want any small matters that are really going to let people attack us because we're on a larger problem that they don't like. Yes, sir.